Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Dr. Sarah Zaldivar is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance in episode 311 of Boundless Body Radio, which was two years ago. Amazing. Time flies. Dr. Sarah Zaldivar has a PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition from the University of Miami. She had previously completed her bachelor's and master's degrees in nutrition and dietetics, in addition to a hospital internship before passing the board examination to become a licensed dietitian. She has also previously taught nutrition courses for several years at the University of Miami, DeVry University, and Miami Dade College. She is a certified personal trainer and a certified exercise physiologist with the American College of Sports Medicine, for whom she taught workshop training, training students to sit for the ACSM's personal training certification. She is currently fully focused on content creation on social media, helping others find optimal health through a carnivore diet, mindset shifts, exercise, and dance. An equally important component, excuse me, of her work focuses on longevity, anti-aging, and implementing carnivore and animal-based diets to her clients to help keep them healthy and thriving. Dr. Sal Sarah Zaldivar, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you so much, Casey. I'm super excited to catch up again. Super. I'm so excited. I stumbled through your introduction. <laughs> That's how <laughs> it's excited fine. I am. It's a long one. I, every time uh, like... When I you get it, she's like, wow, I've done all these things. Like in my mind, I'm always like, I haven't done nothing yet. I'm always, you know, and so when somebody <laughs> reads it out to you, it's like, wow, it's wow, that's been a, lot. a while. It's been a, a long time, uh, you know, just working hard, hustling. And it, you would think like the PhD would have been like the biggest thing, but it's actually social media. That's where the bulk of the work is really. It's been years yeah. now that I've been doing social media. Yeah, I just absolutely love that that is your focus because that's where people are. And as much as I, I, I don't love social media, but but that's what you have to do. And you've been able to mm -hmm. successfully transition away from a college to doing this full time. I think it's marvelous. I think it's fantastic. You should be very proud. Thank you. I, I appreciate it so much. Sometimes it's good to remember that. And I just did a post yesterday. It was like having... You know, not... Uh, oops, that's my mic. Let me move it a little bit here. <laughs> I was having like uh, just... I put so much pressure on myself in my mind. I'm always, I've done nothing, you know? So um, I did a post about like mental health and just how important it is. Like just breathe. You've accomplished a lot already. Have gratitude. Be proud of what you've done. No matter what it is that you've done, there's always something to be proud of. So thank you for that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. It's interesting in this community. I find that the more guests I have on, I ask this question, like, what are you planning on in the future? Or what's your vision of the future? And oftentimes, people don't have exactly a clear cut idea of what the future is going to look like. But one thing I notice universally in this community is it's not going to stop. Whatever it is, there's no intention of slowing down or stopping. It's a grind. It's a lot of work. And nobody cares because this message has to get out and we're going to keep pushing it. It's, it's the carnivore thing and because we stumbled across this. So there's an excitement about, you know, uh, spreading, how, spreading this message that we wish we would have received a very long time ago. And then you couple that with social media where the harder you work, the more your influence, impact, income, everything. So it's kind of hard to take a day off. Because, you know, like if I work today, I can do this much more, you know, so it's, it's a double whammy. Yeah, definitely. And we're always, again, so focused on the future and getting this message out. We're always looking in front of us and how much work we have. I love what you said, though. It, sometimes we need to look back and recognize how far we've all come, how, how much we've done and be proud and give ourselves that grace to know that yeah, we're growing. We've got a long ways to go, but at least we've, we've, we've grown as much as we have so far. Well said. Well yeah. said. It's amazing. And, and just yesterday on social media, I just saw another article, this by Time Magazine, that was talking about how ultra processed foods are good for people <laughs> and we need to get them out. It's just ridiculous how crazy this message is. And those, those goddamn, it's the headlines. The headlines are going to grab so much attention and people are going to say, like they always do, I knew keto was stupid. I knew carnivore was dumb. It was going to kill me of a heart attack. I'm fine eating the processed crap at the grocery store. It's right. absolutely absurd. I think... Anytime you're second guessing yourself, go online, look at, there are very quick videos that show you the whole process of how seed oils are manufactured. Just, just take two, three minutes out of your day. I made sure I showed this to my students at Miami Dade College when I would teach nutrition. And even at the University of Miami, I would show them the videos. It's a, the, I think probably the first one that shows up is a three minute video. Everybody should watch that. Everybody should see the 
I think what, like a 50 step process and then they add deodorization to mask the horrendous smell of the oil. A gazillion chemicals are added to it and then, and that's considered a health food, really. It's and that's not... found in all the ultra processed foods, you know? Yeah. Anything that's processed, let alone ultra processed. Look at the ingredient list, probably the second, third, like somewhere on the ingredient list is going to have a seed oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, corn oil, peanut oil, all of those. We have no business eating those foods. They're not foods. They were engine yep. lubricants. That was their intended um, purpose when they first yep. came on market. Yep. No, I, I, yeah, it's crazy. I'll tag that video again. I think we're thinking of the same one. It's from the show, uh, How It's Made, Canola Oil. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's the most tagged video we've ever had on our show. I put it on almost every episode, it seems like. Right. It's so disgusting. It's yeah. gross. People yeah. eat it. It's in everything. I, yeah, I, it's just like basic education. There's no person with basic common sense that can watch that and come up with the conclusion that, oh, yeah, seed oils are fine and, and even healthier than animal foods or animal fats. No way. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, right. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's so bizarre. Um, okay, so when we talked two years ago, you told us your personal story, which I love. Um, today, I want to talk to you about dopamine and the vagus nerve and all kinds of cool stuff that you're exploring. I did want to go back a little bit on your story and ask you yeah. what it was like, um, because you had found the carnivore diet, you'd found it super helpful for your own health, but you were still in the university and college system teaching students. And so I, I, we talked briefly about it last time, but I didn't want to pass it up. Like, what was it like to be in an institution? W were you supposed to teach a certain curriculum and you'd sneak those videos in where you could? Or like, how did you manage that? I think um, because I had zero supervision, I managed to last as long in that system. Like, no, but I would give them the syllabus and the syllabus had what they wanted me to put on it. <laughs> but on the first day of school, I'd be like, yeah, you don't have to purchase this book. I'm going to give you all of my PowerPoints and everything. And um, it was like full blown what I believed, you know, and I mean, there are certain basics that you, you, you have to give them. Of course, you, you want them to make sure to, that they're going to graduate because a lot of them are like a nursing or other health uh, field. So there are basics that don't change. You know, carbs are, you know, the, the different types of carbs, the fibers of form of carbs, you know, different types of proteins, amino acids, which one essential. Like they're just basic stuff. But then once they go into the um, R the DRIs or the, the RDAs, like how what percent of your calories should come from carbs, proteins, and fats, this is when it's like, okay, this is what the textbook says, but here's the truth, you know? So I would give them both schools of thought. But the cool thing is I would do like a flipped classroom. So I would give them the recordings of the lecturers. I had recorded them once in my life. I couldn't do it over and over again. <laughs> recorded them once and I would just give it to them to my students. And then every time we would meet, it would be all collaborative, me just basically answering their questions. And so it was all the time, the whole semester would be... Um, well, if you recommend a carnivore diet, well, what about fiber? What about heart disease? And so they really received an insane in-depth um, education on real nutrition. And that also helped my sanity because I couldn't be feeling hypocritical, you know, they're teaching the wrong stuff. I wouldn't have lasted. I would have quit decades ago. Yeah. That's so cool. You were able to like infiltrate the system and get our, get our message out there. It's yeah. funny. Um, we worked for a large corporation, a big gym, my wife and I. And when we found ketogenic diets to be really helpful, we, we had a weight loss contest that we were supposed to execute from the company. And mm -hmm. we kind of did the same thing. We, nobody, we didn't have a lot of supervision where we were. And so we would go to diet doctor, print out meal plans back when diet doctor was something I recommended to people. And we would give people these low carbohydrate meal plans and say, forget what the company's telling you. Yeah. We're going to teach you this stuff, eat these meals. And the success rate was tremendous to the point yeah. that like our job satisfaction was so much higher. We were actually finally helping people. Right. What and why do you no longer recommend the diet doctor stuff? Uh, that's a tricky one. They, so, so diet doctor in particular has moved from being like the hub of all things low carb, like right. all the videos, meal plans. They had a meal planning um tool that was fantastic, recipes, all kinds of resources. To now they move towards a satiety per calorie kind of idea and system, um, which is more. It's based on three factors, which is um satiety protein and hedonic factor. And they have this bizarre kind of scale that goes from one to 100. And you're supposed to find foods that combine 
to to be 50 on this target and it's literally things like um um certain branded foods are more satiating than Popcorn. like whole foods like but yes yes like oreos are more satiating than um certain pro it's, it's just this weird kind of convoluted thing that it's not really scientifically proven mm. they tried to open things up to more people besides just low carb I see. but they ended up kind of mess missing in my mind missing the mark and it's no longer something that i feel comfortable recommending for the everyday person mm. it's they basically optimized for weight loss you know because yeah it yeah. is true if you fill your tummy with high volume foods like tons of veggies and popcorn yeah you're not gonna be able to consume tons of calories, you'll probably create that caloric deficit more easily. And if you focus on low hedonic foods, it's not going to drain your brain from dopamine and you're less likely to be craving addictive foods after that. So I can see what they're doing there. But obviously, if we're optimizing for health and if you have an autoimmune condition, or if you just want to be as healthy as you can be, that's not going to be helpful. It's such a slippery slope. It's so easy to go down that hole, you know, and be like, well, you know, popcorn isn't so bad. Now you're eating grains every day and now the skin's breaking out and, you know. Yeah, that's that's the problem. That's my problem I have with it is like, can this be helpful for somebody just coming off the street? Is it better than standard American? Absolutely. But yeah, where this was like a simple resource that I could send somebody if they wanted to do a low carbohydrate diet, it was that resource. It's yeah. just not now, which is unfortunate, but um yeah. Yeah, it's just a different idea. Um, and and on that note, again, talking about dopamine and food addiction, um, I love these topics and I really wanted to explore that with you. Um, yeah. But first, can can you explain why a carnivore diet, although it seems like a fad, is actually nowhere near a fad? Can you talk about that? That's the the one food that we ate for 99.99% of our existence as a species here on Earth. This is what human beings ate. This is what really made us humans. When we first started eating meat, the rate of evolution was supercharged. And then when we learned how to control fire and cook the meat, we were able to extract even more nutrients from the meat. And that led to an even greater explosion in our evolution. And this is why we're no longer uh, chimpanzees or apes or primates. And now we are at the top of the food chain, mainly because of the rate of uh, our intelligence, how fast our brains grew in size and you know complexity. And meat is what, meat and cooked meat is what allowed us to do that. So um, it, it's like looking at a lion and, and telling them, that, hey, you shouldn't be eating meat as you're just eating one from one food group. Like that's what lions eat. You give them something else and it's animal abuse. But we just got so confused as humans as to what our optimal human diet is because there's just so much money to be made from peddling drugs in the form of carbohydrates and addictive foods, natural flavors, all that kind of stuff, sugars, you know, and then the combination is even worse because just eating carbs, there are studies that show, and it's funny, there's a study that was, um, they talked about it on Diet Doctor, and the researcher, the study showed, clearly showed that eating things like oatmeal, rice, pasta, muffins, activates the dopamine release, it's addictive. The length to which that researcher, when she was being interviewed on Diet Doctor, <laughs> with a YouTube video, the length she went to avoid saying the word addiction just blew my mind, you know? And so <laughs> this, the studies are there, but everybody is so afraid to say it because a lot of dietitians and a lot of researchers, if they're working within the system to keep their job, they cannot go against the grain, you know? It's, it's just, that's the mouth that feeds this whole industry. The health experts, the nurses, the every the, the doctors, the hospitals, you know. So yeah. 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 Okay. So very interesting. Now I, I I hope that the listener didn't miss this, but when you said carbohydrates, you used the word drug. And I think that might catch a lot of people off. Like drugs are cocaine and heroin and the mm -hmm. things we know we shouldn't be doing and you know, yeah. whatever, but they might not associate with something that's in every food seemingly as that actually a drug. Let me say something. When I say drug or anything addictive, doesn't always mean that you shouldn't be doing it. Because when people, people have this association, this negative association with addiction, there, anything that releases too much dopamine in the brain and uh, is very pleasurable, all of a sudden is an addiction. It's yeah, but that does not necessarily mean it's a negative addiction. There are such things as positive addictions. And addiction truly, the, like the longer I study it, the more I realize addiction is simply untapped potential. People who have a lot of potential in them and deep down they know it, but they're not getting after it. 
your brain, an addict's brain, requires a lot more stimulation to be happy as opposed to somebody who doesn't struggle with addiction, they just tend to be happy with less. They're like, you know, wake up, they go to the beach, life is great, fantastic. They don't have issues with that. A brain like mine, I'm going to be like, for me to be happy, I have to be accomplishing and accomplishing and accomplishing and doing stuff and then another, you know? And so normally when you look at people who have achieved like tons of stuff in their lives, they tend to have an addict's brain, but they just learned that you, they can satisfy it in a constructive way as opposed to in a damaging way by uh, getting hooked on things like cocaine or heroin or food or video games or sex or shopping or anything like that. And so it's not, it's not about being afraid of releasing all this dopamine. It's about what is the focus of your dopamine release? Where, where are you pointing that weapon to? Yeah, interesting. So what would be some of the positive addictions then? Would that be being very productive, creation, that kind of exactly. thing. Exactly, being uh, you know creative, uh, accomplished, getting after your dreams, not not living below your potential. Yeah. Okay. I really like that because I you're you're right. I think the message for most people is addiction is always bad, and people that have you know that type of addictive personality are always going to get in trouble. But there are ways to channel it um, yeah. in, in in positive ways. And dopamine, for example, it rewards us for certain behaviors. Yeah. It's just that in our environment, it seems that we have way too many things that are stimulating it all the time. Is that fair to say? Yes. And in the wrong way, because you can get that same level of stimulation in a positive way. You mm. see, it's, it's not so much being afraid of stimulating your brain. It's okay to stimulate your brain. Your brain, if you have an addict's brain, it wants that stimulation. And that's okay. It's not a bad thing. The problem mm. happens when you start getting the stimulation from checking your social media every five minutes, not being productive, not putting out content that's valuable in the world as opposed to just, you know, you're just consuming stuff um, or just all kinds of drugs, you know, that are probably not going to improve your health. Um, that's, that is the central theme that I feel like I really um, want to bring home for people so that they're no longer living in this fear-based mindset. It's, it's, your, it's your greatest gift. Having that brain is really, it's your greatest gift because that means you're a driven, you're a naturally driven person. You just mm. need to focus that on the right things in your life, you know? Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. so, so what is it about proteins and fats that don't seem to trigger that kind of addictive behavior, but carbohydrates and sugar in particular do? Mm. So... I think it's, uh, so whenever you're consuming protein, well, fat does have some dopaminergic activity. It does You can say that fat can be, you know, releases dopamine in the brain. Protein, not so much. Carbohydrates, because they're so calorically dense and historically it's always been very rare to find carbohydrates in nature. Normally when you would come across carbs in the form of fruits or tubers, they are far less likely to be toxic as opposed to carbohydrates in the form of vegetables where you have plant toxins and anti-nutrients. So we've evolved to differentiate that anything that's sweet or carby, that's non, a non-vegetable, it's like, ooh, I'm most likely going to survive <laughs> eating this. Let's eat more of it and let me get all those calories. So we evolved through um, long stretches of potential famine. So our biggest threat to our existence, our survival has been famine. So we evolved all of these ways to always guard against it, to always guard against uh, potentially dying. And so one of the ways that uh, helped us is developing this affinity for sweetness. Anything that is sweet and also breast milk tends to have a little bit of sweetness. That's another reason. Anything that is sweet it signifies abundance and calories and healthy calories, non-toxic calories and tons of calories too. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Now, the problem is that the food industry has learned how to concentrate it to supernatural levels. And, and that's something we've never come across historically. We've, we've, it's not that there's something inherently bad about eating sugar. It's just that we haven't had enough time, evolutionarily speaking, to select for the people that can handle all the sugar and not be sick for them to be able to reproduce enough times and have, e and he have enough um, children and grandchildren that all carry that gene or multitude of genes that would allow them to be fine with eating all the sugar. So there's nothing inherently good or bad about anything. It's just about giving a, a species enough time so that the people that cannot handle all the sugars 
die off or get sick and they can't reproduce. And the ones that can, they propagate their genes over and over and over. And you repeat that over generations. That's how evolution works. Yeah. It's funny. I, um, I started really freaking out in the last few years um, when I would be teaching nutrition at the University of Miami and at Miami-Dade College. All these 17, 18, 19, 20, 22-year-old kids, they don't even know how to explain the basics of evolution. It's something that has really started to freak me out. And um, I think it's important that we talk about that. It's like, just give me in a sentence or two, how does evolution work? Because it is the bedrock of like understanding carnivore, to understanding, um, trying to go back and understand how our physiology thrives, under which conditions our physiology thrives. And they didn't know. <laughs> they did not that's interesting. Know. It's wild to me. Wow. Do you think that's deliberate? I think there's a lot of, uh, I, I know there was a, a girl that she would teach the nutrition courses sometimes, like if I'd be sick or whatever, I'd ask her to go, you know, and teach for me. And she was also in the same PhD program with me at the University of Miami doing exercise physiology, but she also had a background in nutrition, so she could also teach the courses that I would teach. And I remember once I was having a conversation, she's like, yeah, like when I talk about evolution, I tell them, I, she always like prefaces that or says after that, like, if you believe in it. Like, you know, like that's an option. Science is an option. You can choose to believe it or not. And I was like, wow. Yeah, no wonder people have no idea. It's like basic science, complete ignorance. It's wild wow. to me. That's so interesting. Maybe we could start to say that about other sciences like gravity. Like, if you believe in gravity, then uh, this, here's the science. Yeah. It's, it's so it's, interesting. Uh, we should, yeah, I think, I think it, like someone needs to raise the alarm on this stuff, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. not okay to not teach our students basic science, science that has established all of the medical breakthroughs and even the, the nutrition, you know, the way that we look at nutrition, you know, like, I, I don't know, it's just wild to me how a university student cannot understand the basics of, of, of evolution, which yeah. like in bio 101, you should be taking that in high school, not, not at the college level. That's wild. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, you live in Florida. I live in the Salt Lake Valley here in Utah. It's, yeah. you know, coming up to the end of summer, and I always marvel this time of year about how many plants are everywhere, yeah, diversity, so many plants everywhere, so many things growing, things are becoming ripe. And I know of in my neighborhood that I walk all the time, there's like three or four fruit trees. A few people have gardens and are deliberately raising um, some plants to be used and consume, mostly tomatoes around here. Maybe you can comment about what it's like in Florida, like as, as you're in a very lush, not kind of subtropical kind of environment. Do you ever just walk around and see like this wonderful array of all these different plants and, and marvel that there's like no food that you can eat? That's a very good point. Yeah. Like even if you go and you see all the vegetation and stuff, it's not like you can go, go around, pick at this food and be eating it. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. 80% of plants are toxic. 80% of any kind of uh, vegetation. Like we never would walk around and just pick at stuff. Stuff. Even things that you might think is edible, like olives, people think, oh yeah, olives, that's, what more natural food can that be than that, you know? And you can't even eat olives. If you go to an olive tree and you pick an olive, it's toxic and you will know it right away. It's so bitter. So even, even canned olives, when you eat them, they have been pre-treated <laughs> to remove and extract the toxin from it before you actually can consume it. Um, let alone like then afterwards they have to process it into, you know, virgin or extra virgin olive oil. So, and also another thing is that if we look at historically versus nowadays, it's only been in the last 300 years that we've hybridized fruits and plant foods and tubers like sweet potatoes or potatoes or any kind of fruit and even vegetables to select for higher sugar and by proxy lower fiber content so that they would taste better so that they would be more likely to be purchased again and so you know i would go through a whole series uh, i saved a playlist for my students and it had um it's, it was a series of documentaries that were done it's all on youtube and they show you they go literally plant by plant every single plant that we're eating and they show you the current version versus just a few hundred years ago, the wild version. So our my students, like their minds would be just mind blown by the end of it. Yeah, I would start every session by like that five or 10 minute YouTube video. And then we would start talking about whatever it is that we would be talking about. But by the end of the semester, they're like, is there anything natural? Like if carrots, go and look at the wild carrot, look at a wild watermelon, look at a wild banana. 
uh, potatoes, all tiny and toxic and on like most of them unedible apples, everything that you think is oh natural when you know we we never our DNA was never exposed to this mega dosing of carbohydrates and sugars the way that it is being exposed to in this day and age. So no wonder we're having all of these carbohydrate intolerance diseases, you know, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, um, you know, I mean, uh, PCOS, which is, you know, diabetes of the ovaries, and women are having to struggle with acne and facial hair and cysts and infertility and an inability to lose weight. And it all boils down to the fact that we are no longer thriving and eating under conditions of ketosis. Our bodies forgot how to use fat as a mean energy source. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was important to bring up because you, you're talking about what you said earlier, like carbohydrates themselves are not necessarily the problem. It's a question of supply. Like we just do not, would not have access to carbohydrates all of the time, all year round in every place in the globe. And again, even places like where you live where, where it's very lush, like there's not just food growing everywhere. It's very, very rare. Yeah. The fruit trees in my neighborhood that I mentioned, these aren't Bartlett pears or Granny Smith apples. These are like crab apples and tiny little pears. Bugs get at them. Birds get at them. All kinds of other animals want them yeah. as well. And so you're like in this competition. So it makes a lot of sense that when we have those carbohydrates, like you mentioned, we have a drive, an evolutionary drive to consume as much as we can while we can, because in a few weeks, no more, they're gone. Yes. And your body thinks you might, you know, if you don't store enough fat right now, while well, you have access to all these carbohydrates, what if you're going to run across a famine in a few weeks or maybe next week and you're going to then starve to death? So, yeah, we've developed all of these defenses against starvation, which kind of makes it very hard for people to lose weight or control their food intake, especially when it's in the form of carbohydrates. Now, I'm not saying that people can't lose weight because they're eating apples. I think you know that that is not what I'm saying. There's tons. I have tons of clients. I know tons of people that are. They eat rice. They eat oatmeal. They eat apples. They eat and they're shredded and they can control it and that's fine and that's fantastic. I think the problem happens when you really have a history of dabbling in ultra processed foods that are yeah. designed to bypass every single potential defense against overconsumption of calories. That's that's the real big problem here. You know. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I think about our evolution. I think about certain like inflection points of like where we've really changed, you know, what we're eating, like with the agricultural revolution 10 to 15,000 years ago, our brain started shrinking more of a gradual change to now a lot more recently, like the ultra processing of food. Mm. And maybe you could talk about some of these food companies who are literally, they were bought, a lot of them were bought by the cigarette companies yeah. and they're running the same type of addiction plays. They are just doing the same thing that they were doing before by mm. advertising, targeting children, making things really affordable and accessible. And like mm -hmm. they're doing the same thing that they did for smoking, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. Philip Morris, for example, bought a bunch of, I think, was it Kraft or like, a like basically most of the current big food companies that own basically all of the, the, the brands of uh, processed foods are owned by cigarette um, companies. I did a fantastic interview with Dr. Joan Ifland. She is a pioneer in uh, addiction research. It, people should definitely go and like watch that because she breaks down the five A's of addiction. She talks specifically about the playbook that the uh, cigarette uh, companies, w the one that they used for addiction, how it helped them become very successful with selling nicotine and cigarettes and how they took that and applied it to the food companies that they bought and clearly it's working. And it's, uh, let me see if I remember, age of onset, the younger that you introduce a, a, an addictive substance, the more likely that that person will never be able to break free from that addiction. Um, availability is found everywhere. Uh, affordability, they're very cheap, <laughs> nothing cheaper than sugar and carbs, right? Um, what, what, what else? Affordability, availability, age added, um, added ingredients, so added Addiction, addictive the, ingredients. Right, the actual addictive thing. The thing is they're using multiple addictive com compounds together. It's not just the sugar, right? Because it's not like it's very hard to stop eating pure sugar. It's really the combination of that with fat, with salt, with caffeine. That's the real problem. And then you add uh, casein from dairy, which also has a, an addictive profile. Now, the thing that people aren't really aware of is the natural flavors. That's what really mm -hmm. backs up and increases the exponential potential um, of addiction of that food. So, 
And then uh, what's the last one? See that I I think it's advertising. I think is the last one. Good one. Yes, advertising. That's right. Yep. And it's everywhere. Yep. Yeah, you can no, you can crazy. go a day. Yeah, on whether you're on social media, whether you're watching a cable or um, YouTube or whatever, anywhere you go, you, you get out of the house. It's everywhere. Yeah. Well, I remember it as a kid. Um, and it's so much worse now, but like you'd watch your cartoons and then there would be the commercials. And for, for me, like a, a kid, like you can't hardly even distinguish the difference between the two because they have characters and they're doing stuff and it's animated and looks, it looks great. So it's, it's like, you can't even tell the difference between the commercial and the actual show itself. And now it's like, you can walk through the store. Every aisle has something that's related to cereal products. Cereal products have like infiltrated everything. I saw protein, uh, drinks at, at a local Sam's club that had two can Sam on it and fruit loop flavored protein, whatever's in that can't be great. I, I'm just going to yeah. say, but like you see all of these characters in every aisle of the grocery store, whether it's yeah. ice cream or granola bars or whatever. And, and even like characters that were originally cartoons, like SpongeBob SquarePants is now also on food everywhere. So it's, it's just so insidious how that message kind of leaks into, especially the kids. Yeah. You grew up thinking that that's a normal life, that, that that's normal food. So it becomes very difficult when you are faced with a condition where you have to change. It becomes very, very, very difficult to change. And that's yeah. what they're counting on, right? They they want to hook you in every which way. Yeah, exactly. So so talking about some of the, the research that you've been doing on addiction and how it relates to the vagus nerve, I'm really um, curious mm -hmm. to ask you about that. Yeah, so um, this is something whereby I feel like um, a lot of people think that they can only do carnivore because it relieves all of their symptoms when their issue and then when they realize like oh it helped a little bit but then it didn't and they realize the issue is that, that they have a vagus nerve dysautonomia so the vagus nerve connects the brain to your gut it's like a two-way highway it's like the biggest you know nerve fastest nerve all of those um chemical um signaling is coming into and from it, you know, for connecting, it's like a two-way highway connecting the brain and your gut. And um, if you, like me, lived in survival mode for a very long period of time, always stressed out, always just trying to survive, never really relaxing. Uh, maybe you grew up in an environment where the people who are supposed to make you feel the safest were actually the source of your trauma. Or maybe the country that you're living in, um, you know, also is a source of uh, additional trauma. And then, you know, just like there are so many potential things that could uh, inflict long term, uh, nonstop stress response on you. The vagus nerve is supposed to calm you down, supposed to activate the parasympathetic nervous system as opposed to the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic it means like the stress response. The parasympathetic is the opposite of that. It calms down the stress response. But if in all of your life, you the stress response is always on, always on, and the vagus nerve is trying and trying and trying so hard to calm the stress response, eventually it tires out. It's kind of like a type 2 diabetic. Been, they were never supposed to eat all this carbs, but they kept eating carbs, kept eating carbs, kept eating carbs, and the, their their pancreas kept releasing all of this insulin. At some point, it's going to tire out, which is why a lot of people with type 2 diabetes eventually become um, uh, like type 1 diabetics, where they actually have to inject insulin because whatever insulin their pancreas was able to secrete eventually tires out the pancreatic beta cells that die off, and they have zero ability now to release any kind of insulin. So it's kind of like a similar fashion. It's just your vagus nerve is tired <laughs> and so now it can't really calm you down it's, it's it doesn't really work though it's supposed to and so that's a problem because it innervates your gut the gut is the seed of your health your skin your energy level your mood your waistline everything really starts in the gut but if your vagus nerve cannot lead to a proper migrating motor complex or proper motility of your gut then you start developing something that I find in almost everybody, which is SIBO or SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, candida overgrowth. Um, and that can lead to autoimmunity because when then you start having leaky gut and then your immune system gets activated and it starts attacking its own tissues. Like everything really can start from vagus nerve dysautonomia. People who have long COVID, um, they were shown that they gave him nicotine lozenges. So nicotine activates the vagus nerve. So you take a nicotine like gum or lozenge, it activates the vagus nerve, kind of like forces it to work. 
and it releases acetylcholine because that's that's the main neurotransmitter that the vagus nerve works on. So they gave him nicotine, and so and so the vagus nerve started working, releasing acetylcholine, and all of a sudden the symptoms of long COVID were gone. Um, just it's fascinating, right? So there's so many things that people might think like, or or if the carnivore helped them for a while, but because the underlying issue is deeper than that, and they didn't realize it. Um, that I think it's good for people to know that I'm preparing a bunch of content to start posting on that. Wow. Yeah, that'll be super, super helpful. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know kind of what the fix is for some of this stuff. But yeah. before we go there, I, we know that there are people who can do party drugs once a year and they can have a weekend and do drugs and then they show up to work on Monday and everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, we know people can dabble. I, I know I, I can't relate to this, but people can open up an ice cream, you know, a pint of ice cream, have three bites, put it back, set it back in the freezer. Like I yeah. could not do that. The last time I bought a jar of peanut butter, it was gone in like two days. Like I, I, I'm an abstainer. I think you are too, but what, yeah. how, how would somebody know whether this addiction is a problem in their lives and something they need to address? Yeah. Um, like I obviously watching your behavior around those substances is going to tell you whether you can abstain or not. Um, and it's, it's good to know that you can always get to a place where you no longer need to be 100% an abstainer, but what, what determines if somebody is an abstainer or a moderator, your baseline dopamine level, the lower your baseline dopamine level is when you consume a drug, it's going to increase that dopamine what, what do we call it? There's like a phasic and tonic. Tonic dopamine is your baseline. Phasic dopamine is like the instantaneous release of dopamine. They work on different receptors. The tonic, uh, the tonic or baseline dopamine works on the D2 receptors and the phasic works on dopamine one, D1 receptors. So they, but they, they both, you know, release dopamine. So if your baseline dopamine is low and you have a phasic dopamine release because you had a bunch of ice cream, it's going to be, so high relative to your baseline and it's the scope or the how much it elevates above baseline that determines if that leads to memory consolidation of that experience and that's what addiction is you have a very strong memory of what that felt like versus if you start training harder and harder doing especially cardio it's more powerful than exercise for example or doing visualizations we'll talk about that all those things that can raise your baseline dopamine level as your baseline dopamine level goes up now when you do have that ice cream that phasic release of dopamine is it goes up but it's not that high relative to your baseline to your new baseline so the memory consolidation event doesn't really happen as well so you don't really remember that experience is anything out of the ordinary and so you don't develop an addiction to it that's fascinating that was so well explained i really really appreciate that um, okay. So yeah. So, so for somebody that's realizing that they do have that low dopamine, they, they, they have this kind of, I don't know, this feeling of like a runaway train in their life where they can't stop themselves or eating yeah. more than they think they want to, or it's affecting their life in some way. What are some things they can do to address that and then fix that? Yeah. You have to figure out why is your baseline dopamine so low? There are so many things that affect it. Um, everything that I think most people probably know this, especially if my audience is watching everything that I talk about, how we raise baseline dopamine is in my guide dopamine brain. But the, I guess let's start with the big hitters, the exercise, right? The more fit you get, meaning the faster you can run and the more weights you can lift, the higher your baseline dopamine gets. And cardio is more powerful because it, Actually, let's explain why, why exercise works, because dopamine is an anesthetic. So when you are exercising to hit a new PR, not just doing a joy ride, having fun. If you're having too much fun, it's not working. <laughs> you have to be a little bit uncomfortable because dopamine is an anesthetic. So why would your brain extend any or, or waste any resources, energy, effort, calories to try and build up your dopamine machinery why would it do that you have to give it a strong reason for it to um, justify expending this energy on this stuff and so the reason you give it is the feeling of discomfort because any kind of discomfort which is whether it's emotional pain or whether it is physical pain tells your brain i need an anesthetic i need you to give me some anesthetic so i don't feel this emotional and or physical pain so that's what exercise does also that's what visualization does you have to get a little bit uncomfortable and so The more you do that, the exercise and the visualization, the more your brain is like, okay, 
let's increase more of this anesthetic, let's raise our baseline dopamine level. So it starts increasing the amount of dopamine that it makes and dopamine receptors, specifically G2 receptors. That's really what we want to have more of. And you build your brain back up again that way. Cardio is far more important than strength training. They're both very important. I recommend doing both, but don't say that cardio is unnecessary if you're just focused on strength training because with strength training, yes, you're getting the discomfort, but the duration of the discomfort doesn't last as long as opposed to when you're doing an hour long or maybe 40 minute long cardio session that's uncomfortable. It's just way more time under tension. So just way more D2 receptor building on the other end of that. Wow, that's yeah. so fascinating. I find that so interesting. Um, right. Could somebody do like interval training or is it better to have that kind of steady state like you're describing? I mean, the more intense the running, the more D2 receptors. The longer the discomfort, the more D2 receptors. Now, if you can do high intensity and for a longer period of time, that's great, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like uh, trying to, I would say it's probably like a little bit longer duration as opposed to doing HIIT because while HIIT is great, Maybe do HIIT like once a week, but then the rest do like run continuously. But that running continuously needs to keep getting faster and faster and faster week after week after week. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. Both you and I have certifications in personal training um, and we work with people moving and to, to go back, you know, even like five, 10 years ago and say that, yeah, exercise is really good for your body and you should do it to have, you know, a good aesthetic and feel good and lose fat. It, all this evidence and research coming out about how good the movement and exercise is for the brain is absolutely fascinating. That's what I do it for. I, it's really mainly for my brain, for mental health, for uh, productivity. Um, I feel like that is so much more interesting why we need to yeah. exercise. You know, I, of course, the body composition benefits are fantastic. I'm not going to deny that. But I think when you compare, when you really start to feel the effects of your exercise on your mental health, you're hooked for life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's you You will understand why. There's just so many people that have no reason to be depressed. And if they just added a, a, a healthy workout program, they all of a sudden, their whole outlook on life is going to change, you know? We, so we were better. built to move. That's another evolutionary kind of necessary requirement for our DNA to thrive. Yeah, yeah, I love that. We mentioned in the introduction that you work with dance as well. And I think of that as like one of the very best activities that I suck at, but other people can do to, especially for like mental health as we age to make sure you're active yes. and moving. Dancing is such a great way to do that. Dr. Lauren Cardane, he's like the, you know, the, Dr. Lauren Cardane, he kind of popularized yeah. the paleo movement, right? I yeah, think yeah. he retired a few years ago. We should check okay. up on him. <laughs> he, um, because of his book, The Acne Cure, that was my first introduction to paleo diets, and it cleared my skin just by doing paleo when I was like 18 or 19 or 20, I don't remember. And, um, and so I kind of really would follow up on all of his research, and he has a paper. Um, he has two good papers. One is called Cereal Grains, a Double-Edged Sword. People should check that out. Super cool. goes into grains and how it helped us, you know, become a civilization, the agricultural revolution. And then the, the, the bad part about it, about how we got shorter brain size, shrunk, all the stuff, you know, you know, associated with, the, with eating more plant foods and especially grains. That's a good paper. But he has another paper talking about um, how our hunter-gatherer ancestors, how our ancestors lived for very long periods of time in a healthy uh, way, and they would be eating a paleo diet, but also, and you know, how much they would walk and what they would do for strength training and stuff like that. But something that stuck out to me is that four nights out of the week, they would do a bonfire and they would just be dancing and chanting until the wee hours of the morning. And the idea of that is that music and rhythm is so primal for our health and our happiness, you know? And I was like, yeah, that makes total sense to me. That's so cool. I love that. Right? That's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, now, when it comes to diet, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're both kind of pro-carnivore diet. With, with somebody with food addiction, how, how, how does the transition kind of move towards a carnivorous diet? Is it something that should be done really suddenly, a little bit more gradually? Like, how do you recommend people do that? Uh, for me, the gradual approach helped. Um, for some people, they could. There's some people can do tur like go cold turkey. Uh, oftentimes, when people go cold turkey, though, what I've noticed is that they can do it. They can sustain it maybe for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then they go on like one normal life event, like a concert or a vacation or something, and then they fall off track because they didn't actually build a good foundation, solid foundation to sustain that. So I think you can try it if you're, I mean, of course, if you go cold turkey and it works, that's great. Uh, it's very motivating to start seeing benefits very quickly. 
for me personally, it helped me do it gradually, um, especially my brain was very so addicted to carbohydrates and food addiction and all that kind of stuff. So it, it helped that I did keto for a while. It allowed my body to, under, to, to, to get really keto adapted. And then all I had to do towards the end is just remove the veggies, you know, that's all. Um, yeah. So it, it was easy for me to do it that way. So if you come from, you know, eating a standard American diet or even a Mediterranean diet and thinking you're eating healthy, you're, you're just eating too many carbohydrates. I would suggest first doing a dirty keto phase whereby you just remove the carbs. You can still, if you have a craving, whatever, have some keto chocolate or something like that and allow your body to get keto adapted, then clean up the diet and just do a holistic, like, you know, a whole food based um, carnivore diet. I feel like that would help most people. Got it. Yeah, I think that's a really good transition. That's kind of how I got into it as well. Is like you just kind of take down the carbohydrates, realize you probably don't need the vegetables, and you can just slowly kind of eliminate them. Yeah, um, and nobody even struggles like a, to eliminate veggies. You no, know? <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. And on that note, I, I was curious to ask you, just in your observation, this is going to be very um, high level and generalized because everybody is so different. But we we talk about plant toxins and how you know plants protect themselves in certain parts and and a lot more in vegetables than in fruit. Practically speaking, when you're dealing with somebody who wants to move on to a carnivore diet, do you see a lot of issues with things like oxalates, oxalate dumps, plant toxins that people need to do some type of a detox from? Is that something you see commonly? Or is it something we maybe talk about a lot of the community when most people aren't ever going to experience something like that? I think it's a lot more psychological than it is physiological. I think it's a lot of overcoming the addiction with the low baseline dopamine. I see it a lot more people who can't really work out. When people can work out, nobody seems to have an issue transitioning, which leads me to believe, you know, is it is it just a mental health thing? Is it just that their D2 receptors are so low, they've destroyed them from, you know, decades of food addiction? Or is there more to it? Um, of course, there are some physiological manifestations, you know, that occur, and, and but those are very easy to deal with. It's usually people struggle because they're struggling with their low D2 receptors because then they start, they see a keto rash or something and they freak out and it's like, just have patience. But if your motivation is low already because your D2 receptors are low, your baseline dopamine is low, it's very hard to push through when you start seeing things and, you know, every, the whole world is telling you you should be eating carbs. It's hard. Yeah. I, I, I love that you said that. It's more like psychological than anything. Um, yeah. And how long does it, does it tra- I, again, a very general question, but how long does the transition happen where somebody, it becomes quite happy and satiated and feels really, really good on a carnivore diet? It is so variable, so variable. Yeah. I feel like the vast majority of the people, they've been trying to do carnivore, but it's very hard for people to stick to it long term. I, maybe because I attract a certain subpopulation that has a um, history of food addiction, you know? And so it's not like, like they're just trying to do carnivore because they feel like that's going to cure their food addiction. But the more they understand, it's like, it's not so much about what diet to follow. It's more about fixing your D2 receptors. Um, but, and, and, and there are some people who can just do it no problem. And those are easy cases and you don't really have to give them much direction. You know, it's, it just, it's so hard to generalize because I see all kinds of cases, the easy cases, but usually the toughest of the tough, because I feel like for people to get to a place where they feel like carnivore and then not just carnivore, but me specifically, I feel like I get the, the hardest cases. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to to help, which is fine. I I love it. You know, I'm not complaining. But um, but yeah, I would say. I would say, it takes usually, let's say, the the first three days are the hardest. By the fourth or fifth day, you're coming out of the brain fog from the detox from the food addiction. And then by the 10th day, all your taste buds have regenerated and you forget what sweetness is um, and you're pretty good to go. But again, if you don't have habits in place that you know you can deploy to manipulate your neurotransmitters, to manipulate your baseline dopamine level, that's where the work is. If you wake up early, build momentum during the day. Uh, being productive, you have an addict's brain, you have to like stop fighting, just 
if you have an addict's brain most of the time, there's something inside of you that you're suppressing. There's some unrealistic dream inside of you that you are suppressing and you're trying to be realistic. And it, for as long as you fight for that limitation, you will forever struggle. Mm. That wow. Is, that's, yeah. That's fascinating. That, which is why I talk so much about mindset. It's like 99% yeah. of my consults are just like, it's not, the, the least amount of talk I have with my clients is about what to eat. You know, it's, it's all mindset work. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it, super fascinating and very well explained um we know that people when they transition on to carnivore you know if they do a, a fairly strict version for a little while they can open their diets back up you and i were talking offline about how ridiculous this community can get about what's called carnivore and if somebody has something here or there not like, for it, is that you have a cucumber oh. it's yeah it's ridiculous is that I, a cucumber? I, yeah. <laughs> it's, it is hilarious and it's like I, I understand though i understand where it comes from People who feel like they have to do carnivore, they might have a very serious autoimmune condition or something really important that it's very important for them to eat a carnivore diet because it's controlling their symptoms or maybe curing them completely. And it's so hard to do only carnivore. And so you find help and emotional support and, and it makes you feel happier to know that you're not alone in this. And so they band together. So I understand where that comes from. But then... The other side of that is you've developed this um, zero tolerance to anybody who can eat other things and just be fine and healthy and fit and happy and no disease. Like, why? Why can you do all that? And I can't. I think this is where that cultish kind of um, almost intolerance sometimes comes from. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. I love the way you think about some of these things and have explained dopamine and how we can recognize that as an issue and move past that. I think it's a really important conversation and we should do another one of these conversations and not have it be uh, every two years. Let's do it a little bit more frequently. I, I really yeah. love the way you think about things and see the world and, and explain things really, really well. I'm really happy that you finally moved out of the college kind of environment and now are doing what you're doing and helping people online, which is fantastic. Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, where do you want people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Thank you so much, Casey. I would say the same thing about you. I love your energy, your positivity, tolerance, understanding, everything that you're doing. And I mean, you do so much just for, just to help people. And, 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 and I can see through, I can see that, you know, so thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's easy to find me, drsarahzaldivar.com forward slash shop. Um, you, can, you can probably see my name here, uh, Sarah with an H. Uh, Instagram at drdr.sarah with an H dot Zaldivar. And YouTube is my name, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. So yeah, pretty, pretty easy. Get on my newsletter. I should probably set up a way. I just started with my newsletter. It was great. So I, need, I should set up a way for people to easily sign up to my newsletter, but I don't know how to do that just yet. So I'm not going to ask you this. For it. But if you do purchase a guide, just um, accept the marketing emails, which means you sign up for my newsletter and cool. that way I'll have your email so I can send you. And I, I won't bombard people. I promise like maybe once a month. That's it. That's great. No, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I subscribe to very few newsletters, but the ones I subscribe to are so full of information. I'm sure yours is awesome. And yeah, yeah. Here, I mean, straight to the point, like I, I just sent one on Monday and I gave everybody a free guy, like I gave him a coupon. So they were happy. Um, and I just, you know, like literally like two, two, three sentences, because I like our attention span keeps getting shorter and shorter. Um, and so I just like to go straight to something that's going to help people because I also don't want to spend a whole day to write one newsletter. I also want to say, if I, you know, yeah, if I have one good, really good thing on my mind, it's like, you can say it in one sentence, which is like, I, I'm obsessing over Alex Hormozzi. I binge watch all his content. And he says something really important. He says, like, it's not about values of second. It's about value per second. Mm. So I try to stick to that. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Well, again, thank you, Sarah, so very much for being on our show today. We had a really great chat and really appreciate your content and sharing your message with us today. It was fantastic. So thank you so very much and uh, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. I appreciate you back. And thank you, everybody, for sticking with us till the end. <laughs> exactly right. We really appreciate you, the listener. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.